to jump 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. Oh, Too many car. car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. And you can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Like, me, me. Yeah, I want a man's coolant. <laughs> And he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's har- a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. They'd love to be driven hard. Look to Auto Up Topic. How goes it, Brad? Andrew, it goes wonderful. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. What, uh, what have you been up to? Oh, you're, you're leading me off right in the beginning here with questions of what I've been doing. Uh, yeah. Not a lot. Life has been busy, of course. So, therefore, the car stuff hasn't been completely done. It's been a little bit... A little behind, I guess. But we're I mean, we got some some car stuff happened, right? And garage stuff. You'll have to remind me of my own life because I don't think any car stuff happened. Garage stuff. We're still in the same date as we were last week with drywall going in. Drywall. You told got, me they were almost got, done. Yeah, they're almost done now. The guys we got to do the job. You know, the like the fourth or fifth ones that finally were like, yeah, we can do this. Um, they've only been putting in three or four hours a day as like after their other job. So it's been taking them quite some time, but it uh, seems like they only have two or three sheets left at the peak now. So my hope is they'll be done today. They're still out there right now at 6 p.m. Phoenix time. So my hope is they'll be done today. You know, probably a couple hours of work left. Stay a little late and get it all done and I have to come back. If so, then tomorrow would probably be done. But we do have a scheduled date for our doors to be installed. So that's October 13th or 14th. I have to look it up. I think 14th. So that's exciting. And hopefully sometime between today or tomorrow and the 14th, we can have the electrician come out and finish the electricity now that it's been greenlit because then we need to have the city inspector come back out and give a final green tag for everything so it's like so many moving parts when you're trying to do something above board this every, sure is every step of the way needs to be checked and rechecked and double checked and passed by code and i honestly don't even watching the inspector do his job i don't even understand what he's actually inspecting so they just know the codes off the top of their head, kind of what they're looking for, and just do it. I don't know. I feel like they should come in and, like, touch things and make sure they're tight, but they just kind of, like, stand in there and take down some notes and walk away. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. I guess they know better than me, but it is what it is. But, yeah, it's almost it's almost there. I think I've said that before, but I think this time for real. It will not be done by next podcast, that's for sure. So, I heard you get the doors coming in, though. Yeah, I just said that uh, by the fourteenth. I don't know so, how I missed that. I don't either. It's one of the one of the two things I said. <laughs> but yeah, no, everything's everything's working. I just um, we're getting antsy now because again, this project's been going on for four or five months, and I want the backyard to be back to normal. <laughs> not just with cars parked everywhere and construction equipment everywhere and our grass is just dirt. So it's just a dust bowl where the dogs go back there. And then of course the dogs come back in the house and they bring the dust in the house and it's a nonstop, nonstop dust mitigation routine around here lately. So I'd like that to end, but 
big prep this week is for the Williams show, which is Saturday. Cool. Um, so you're going to that. What are you bringing? I'll let you know more after we record and then add two hours. Uh, okay. Pl- <laughs> you haven't figured it out plan, yet? Yeah, the plan is to bring the Sapporo. Okay. Um, it hasn't been out of the garage in some time. I think it came out for one of the South Mountain events that we have here probably, I don't know, seven or eight months ago. And it's been parked ever since. So another side effect of building the garage in the back is that the front garage has become a staging area for everything we own. So I've been unburying things. Um, I'm going to have to push it straight out because there's just so much stuff run up and down the left side of the car in the garage right now, just because everything's kind of in chaos at the moment. So hopefully I can push it out and then get it going and get that ready to go up. But I only really have one more day to figure it out because we're going to a concert tomorrow night. And then the car show is at like 7 a.m. on Saturday and it's two and a half hours away. So it's going to be a, uh, a rush no matter what. So. All right. I'll either get no sleep or too much sleep. We won't make it. <laughs> yeah. I um I went to a concert last night, so I'm a little tired tonight doing this. So, um, but I am going to the odd drain for the young timers show on Saturday. So I'm going to lot down for that. That looks like it's a really good time. It's canceled last year because of rain. Um, so we'll see how it goes. But it's not supposed to rain. It's supposed to be nice. And I've had the glant out multiple times. So I should be okay. I'm sure the car will be fine. It's been around plenty this year. Just weather's your only issue. You said, you said it might rain. No, I don't think it's supposed to rain at all. I think it's supposed to be okay. really nice. The double check again. So you'll but, be good. Um, I've wanted yeah. to go to a show at that place or just visit that place in general for a while, and I have not. You know, anytime I'm out there, obviously it's not on my top of my list, but I'll look there eventually. We'll see how it goes. I got to take uh, Marco's coming with me. I was like, do you want to go to car show Saturday? He's like, yeah. I was like, it's an hour and a half car ride. And he's like, it's okay. I was like, all right. I mean, he's probably used to it by now. You guys go to New Hampshire a lot, so. Yeah, it's about the same. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> it's all for cars. It's the greater good. It is for cars. Um, but, you know, it gets tricky sometimes trying to chase them around the uh, car show field. So we'll see. It is what it is. It'll be good. He might not remember it for the rest of his life, but you will. So make it happen. Yeah, I'm definitely going to try. And um, I mean, I already bought the ticket. So <laughs> then definitely try. Because uh, I don't know what Jap- the exhibit there is, but it's supposed to be a pretty neat museum. So I don't know what it is either. Japanese Car Day is Sunday, but uh, we have soccer. It's the last soccer game. Uh, and it's right in the middle of the morning. So we'll not be able to make it to Japanese Car Day. That sucks because that's like a standard every year event it is but the way the timing goes usually it's like nine o'clock and then like two o'clock it's finished uh and then so like soccer games at like it's like uh 10 30 to 11 30 and then by the time we get down there the show will be over so yeah it would not be worth it no so yes i think that by having to miss sunday's show you have earned going to saturday's show so you should definitely do it. Yeah, we'll go check it out. Um, so, you know, you've got your show. I've got my show. I guess they're, I don't know. I've always wanted to go to the Williams show, but so maybe next year. We'll try. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? It's uh, it's kind of a bummer because I normally go up Friday night and there's like a, a pre-show dinner the night before that everybody kind of gets together and hangs out. At this place called, uh, I think it's called Cruisers. It's a like a 50s themed Americana kind of diner. 
Yeah, how and appropriate for Route 66. Yes. Well, if you've never been to Williams, which I don't know if you have been or not. No. It's the last town to have been bypassed by the 40. So it leans real hard into the Mother Road, Route 66 aspect of it. It's Radiator Springs. It's essentially Radiator Springs, yes. Yeah, it was one of the main towns they used for the design of Radiator Springs. So it's uh, full of kitschy little gift shops, 50s themed diners, more kitschy little gift shops. There's a steam train that still runs around up there. There's... What's the other thing? Oh, there's a couple of restaurants that are like also like Gold Rush themed. They have like a lot of prospector kind of history up there too, I guess. So it's it's a neat little town. It's definitely the definition of a tourist trap. It's also the town where I ordered a burger at a restaurant and the guy told me that it's illegal in this state for him to make it medium. And I was like, it's definitely not. What? I live in this state, and I get it all the time. <laughs> like, you had to do it well done? Well done, or I couldn't have a burger. Uh, are you telling it's me Ill- your meat's not very good? It's illegal in Arizona to cook something medium. So obviously, I said, you know what, then? I don't think I'll have a burger. I think we're actually going to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So we paid for our drinks, and we found a different restaurant. <laughs> yeah, because... I don't know. Did you not want to put the little asterisk on the menu? Consuming raw or undercooked meat? Uh, I, don't know. I wasn't asking for it raw. I mean, I was asking for it medium, which I think is a pretty standard burger response. Well, that's how they get away with it. All the, all the menus have that little disclaimer on it, at least here. Sure. <laughs> Everywhere. But he told me, uh, I bring that up because it's such a touristy area that he probably figured that we were tourists and would buy his story about Arizona law not allowing me to have a medium burger. So. Well, it's funny. Some places will just only cook it one way, but they'll just be like, oh, we which is, cook it one way. Which is fine. Be like, hey, we cook the burger, how we cook the burger. But don't flat out tell me that it's illegal in this state to have a, a, a medium burger. It can only be cooked well done or you'll go to jail for life. Yeah, that's a weird um, way to say it. Just I was pretty, I was pretty mad. I was pretty mad. So like, oh, we, we just cook them all. Actually, generally... No, because generally when it's like a single temperature, it's usually like medium well. That's usually if they decided to only do it one sure. way, it's medium well. Yeah, it's medium well, which is the probably the way most people at home make their burgers. Yeah. But that's not what he said. <laughs> so thankfully, it is a tourist town and there are plenty of choices of restaurants that aren't that one. So I went somewhere else. <laughs> Weird. But yeah, it's an odd... It was an odd moment in time, but we go to the show every year. We usually go up Friday. She's really excited to go to the Pitbull T-Pain concert, so we're not going to miss that. Um, not my typical show, but I know I'll I'll enjoy it because live music is live music, regardless of. I want to I want to go I want to go back to that Pitbull T-Pain after. Okay, well, I definitely I'm definitely excited to see T-Pain. I don't really know much about Pitbull, but I know he's involved in NASCAR, so I like him anyway. But. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's Friday night. And then the car show, this is the problem and why we normally quit Friday night is 7 a.m. And it's two and a half hours at minimum away. So if I get home from a concert at midnight, I get like four hours of sleep and I'd leave. So... This is why I need to make sure that I'm ready to go by the end of the evening tonight, <laughs> because after work, concert after concert, minimum sleep, drive to car show. And then we will stay up there Saturday night because I, I'll, I'm sure I'll be just junk by Saturday night and not looking to make a two and a half, three hour drive home. So yeah. anyway, that's that's this weekend's plan. So stay tuned to find out what car does get driven up there. All right. So. T Pain and Pitbull, Pitbull co owner of Trackhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and Stephanie's a big uh, T Pain fan. I was saying to her the other day, actually, I was like, 
it's interesting because T Pain does a lot of drifting. I'm like, maybe he'll like, you know, be part of a motorsports team with with a pit bull or something, or uh, like a, all the touring together. Another, so another owner or something of something. Um, but it was like, I don't know, it was just kind of a cool thing. And then it, I bought because he he was at um, Grid Life again, and it was two years ago. I had my no a year ago. I had my picture taken with him. That's also really funny because <laughs> yeah. I only like it. Like I've heard some of his music, but the album, the um, covers album he did is like my favorite. Yeah, no, he's he's actually a people don't know this, but he's a really good singer. Well, people know it now. People don't know. Yeah, they did not for a long time. Um, and he did a cover album. It's really good if you want to check it out. But it was funny because I'm so dense sometimes like his drift team or at least the shirts say auto tuned and I was just di- it just did not dawn on me at all what that was referencing. I was like, yeah, it's cars auto tuned. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I was like like I was like sitting I was like looking at the shirt that I gave Stephanie. I'm like looking at it and looking at it. And I was like, oh auto tuned. <laughs> like, like a it's real a, like a play on words. <laughs> yeah. Like a real like oh Samsonite. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you say, you know, well, they do a race team together, but T-Pain does have his own drift team now, his own race team. He does. Team. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe it'll take, uh, Pitbull, uh, drifting. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're talking about it. If they're on tour together, they have plenty of time to chat about things, but you see a, a track house, nappy boy automotive collaboration event. I mean, that's a good segue. We might as well just get it out of the way. Um, sure. Kansas race. Okay. No, it wasn't, wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible. I, I was out. So I kind of like fast forwarded through most of the stages. There's some good passing. Um, I don't know. I thought, uh, I thought Christopher Bell was going to have a strong car, but he kind of fell off. I don't know what happened. He would get, he did have a strong car. Yeah, but he'd get towards the end of a run and then the car would get loose and he put it in the wall twice. Like I think he was just trying to do hard. Yeah, maybe. I think he was just trying too hard. And, uh, you know, I thought Kurt Busch maybe was going to get uh, get the Finally lead there. Get his win. And then he wrecked or got wrecked. I don't know. It was weird. I don't think he really got wrecked. I think he no, he that. just, uh, listening to commentary afterwards, he just put the car in a bad aero spot and... When the car was there, he had no grip over the rear tires, and the car snap oversteered, which is what happens. Yeah. So, and pretty much every playoff driver, except for like William Byron, had like a crummy day. It seemed like. Yep. Which is good for the other playoff drivers that had crummy days because it was a very weird day. Yeah. And uh, my boy Russ Chastain Trackhouse won. Yep, being a spoiler again, just like last year at the end of the season when he won the championship race. Yeah, unfortunately, it was a win too late to get into the playoffs, but... Hey, it is what it is. It's it's cool to see him still out there putting in maximum effort, trying to get wins, even though he knows he can't win the championship. So you might as well add to your win total, right? Well, I, I thought it was kind of, uh, you know, kind of fitting that he beat... William Byron because William Byron spun him at Daytona. That's true. He had a chance to win Daytona. So I did, I did forget about that. Yeah. So, and then uh, this week coming up is the Roval, right? I think, no, I thought, is it, or is this week Dega, Talladega? Oh, you're right. Talladega is first. Yeah. You are correct. Mm Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, so, it's been it's been all good races. It's been a very entertaining playoff. Um, well, except for Bristol. <laughs> except for Bristol, yeah, I guess. That was boring. Uh, actually, Bristol wasn't too too boring. I, I think, yeah, maybe it was. We'll leave it at that. Bristol was not great. No. Um. But you know, this last race wasn't too bad. I kind of, like I said, I fast forward through most of it because I missed most of the race. I came home late. I just wanted to get to the last stage. So, 
I know there wasn't too much that went on. There was a, the wreck of the first lap, and then kind of, you know, all the typical people spun that spin during a race. Close cautions. Yeah, there was there was some a few good battles that you missed if you fast forward through the race, but nothing you probably wouldn't be able to catch in the thirty minute pre thirty minute recap that NASCAR puts out there. Yeah. So. Yeah, looking forward to Talladega this week, though. That should be pretty cool. It should be. I expect Back another full spoiler race, too. Like, more playoff stuff happening. I expect there to be non-playoff drivers up in the mix a lot. Let's get, I was let's listening. Get, uh, let's get Bubba to get a win. Yeah, I was listening to one of the other NASCAR podcasts, and they were talking about why there are so many non-playoff drivers that are spoilers in these events now. And they're like, oh, the the biggest reason of all is that they can take chances we can't. If you're a playoff driver, you can't take a chance. You have to do what all the other playoff drivers do. You got to be in the same strategy or else, you know, you, you can't lose points to them. If you're not a playoff driver, you can roll the dice. And rolling the dice might turn out in your favor and you wind up in the front of the pack and win a race. So... It just makes a, a whole different experience for those who are in the playoffs and those who aren't in the playoffs. You know, they kind of have nothing to lose at this point. Like, hey, let's roll the dice now. We're not, we're not going to win a championship. Maybe do something crazy. We can still win a race. Yeah. So. The other important NASCAR thing is the big lawsuit. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up because I almost forgot after I'd looked it up before the podcast. And been thinking about it like all day. Uh, 2311 and Front Road Motorsports. So it's uh, the team that is owned by 2311 is owned by Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin. And the drivers are Bubba Wallace and Tyler Reddick. And then Front Row Motorsports is, is it Michael McDowell this year? I think only for this year. Just for the remainder of this year. And I forget who the other driver is. Thought about it all day. Yeah. But uh, it's funny because the most of the articles about it don't really mention Front Row Motorsports that much because... Uh, Todd they're... Gilliland, Michael McDowell, okay. and yeah. part-time Kaz Grala. Okay. Uh, it's not yeah, one cause... name. His name is Kaz, last name Grala. Yeah, because he has another... He has his own race team that SVG has been racing on for... Xfinity series. Yes. Very complicated. It's all very complicated. Um, um, I think but, he was Rick. He races for Rick Ware, doesn't he? I think so. So but, well, fun fact, Kaz Grala is a Massachusetts native. So yes, he started his racing career the same place that we did. Yeah. Yep. Where is that? F1 Boston. Oh, nice. Unfortunately, we didn't make it as far as he did. No. <laughs> the um, we, we started and ended at F1 Boston. He kept going. <laughs> that place is closed. It's weird. That is it gone now? Reop- yeah, it's weird that nobody's reopened it as something else. Hmm. They is there any go kart racing in that area? Just the K1 place in Wilmington. Well, oh, that makes sense because that's a national chain. Yeah, but you think they like, well, the other place is like, I don't know, with all the fancy things that they build now. You think somebody would reopen it, but anyway, you know, like put like a bowling alley in with it or something. Yeah, entertainment center. But uh, yeah, anyway, the uh, the, the trampoline park, right? Um, yeah, exactly. All right, <laughs> it was out here. It'd be pickleball. <laughs> yeah, oh, same here. Okay, back to NASCAR. <laughs> the um, really the only team getting any press is twenty three eleven because the co owner is Michael Jordan. Sure. So they are suing NASCAR for antitrust laws and the irony there is that nascar was like super stoked and excited to have michael jordan get involved because he was gonna you know save the sport with all his fans and then he's like wait you guys suck no wonder nobody's here i'm gonna sue you (laughs) yeah well the issue comes down to this charter system they've been trying to do and they i think a lot of these smaller teams are just not happy with the amount of profits that are being shared with the teams. 
because you got to look at it. It's like, uh, unlike other, you know, pro sports leagues, NASCAR owns the entire league. It's not, uh, let's see here. What do they sell? They, they own a majority of the actual venues. They own most of the marketing. They yeah. own, obviously, all of the rights to all of the races. They own all of the media. There's no they own some way to tracks, have... Like that's what I'm saying. They own the actual, actual facilities. There's no way to have it broken up the way it is in other sports. And yeah. you can think of the charters kind of like... I guess like a like a team. I guess like you know the Red Sox would be their own charter franchise. in MLB a, fr- a franchise exactly same kind of deal, and then each charter depending on quite. what their deal it's it's the, it's the closest assimilation of it, and then each charter is depending on whatever their deal is allowed to have X amount of cars and no more than that, so they couldn't just one week be like hey we have seven drivers this weekend we're going to run them all because they don't have enough charters to run all the cars. Yeah. So. Uh... NASCAR, the top motorsports league, this is from a Bloomberg Law article, is distinct from other major professional sports leagues, which are owned and operated by the teams. NASCAR, by contrast, has always been privately owned by the France family, which the complaint refers to as monopolistic bullies. Oh, what is it? Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? That's Yeah, you don't, you know, at least, you know, in other leagues, you've got, you know, there's like people that run the league, but then the teams and the players have fairly decent bargaining rights. I mean, we all remember the baseball strike. What was that? 20 years ago? Probably. I, every uh, major sports had a strike in the past 20 years. So all the big sports leagues have players unions. Uh, so, but NASCAR doesn't have like a driver union. So, right. But the closest to having a driver union is to, be part of Michael Jordan's team, probably one of the wealthiest teams in NASCAR, and uh, just say, all right, well, we're not going to sign the contract. We're going to sue, and then they can do whatever they want because we are the well, biggest money sport, biggest money team in the event here, and uh, we'll just start our own series. <laughs> well, NASCAR says they could revoke the charter, but then it's like, well, that doesn't look very good for NASCAR to revoke the charter from absolutely not someone like Michael Jordan. Yeah. Absolutely not. And I'm sure they won't. No, that's like, that'd be like a real bad move. And they're definitely playing that up. Um, But I I don't think they're wrong. I think they, they do need to take it to NASCAR. And because the, the big thing is these teams put on entertainment for us every week and they just want more of the profits shared with them. To offset yeah, they're, they're the spending costs. a ton of money to run these events. And one of the things I've learned you know, through this whole saga is that a lot of the smaller teams, you know, like a front row motorsport, they don't make any money at the end of the week. If, nope. if they don't have a good week, if they, you know, crash out early, if they'd have finished back of the pack, they could, they could lose money at an event where NASCAR is raking in you know, millions of dollars and, and they just want to have a cut of that so that they're not as dependent on outside sponsorships and stuff because there's only so many of those to go around and not everybody can be a Denny Hamlin or a, um, Kyle Larson. You know, you have the Kaz Gralas of the world who Michael don't McDonald. have name, they don't have name recognition. So, you know, they're not going to get a, a Chili's restaurants deal, you know? Yeah. And, you know, these guys are, you know, maybe they wreck. And while well, NASCAR goes and use that for a promotional video, uh, are they yep. getting any money for that? Nope. You know, there's drama on the track. You know, they get into a couple of fights. They find these guys, but they're going to play that footage over and over again. Sure are. Um, so, and the other thing, I guess, too, it comes down to the, the next-gen cars. They are basically property of NASCAR. And all the they have set all the suppliers, so there's no way to get cheaper parts. Whatever the parts cost, that's what the parts cost for these cars. Yeah, you got to buy them from that one supplier. Yeah. Which you know, I suppose for the in fairness, I guess, but you know, I don't know. Maybe I don't know what they could do to figure that out. <laughs> I I do but, miss a little bit of the innovation that NASCAR used to promote. 
but I guess in this world of 2024 where technology is where it is, it would be too difficult to police some of that technology if it was done that way. So where technology is so good now that people could fake things in different ways than they used to be able to. You know, it's NASCAR has always been a support of gamesmanship where it's like, yeah. you know, one upping the guy next to you with, you know, either some kind of cheat or some kind of new technology that hasn't been outlawed yet was always kind of a fun thing in the sport. And where now it's basically a spec series, it's a lot harder to do that. The other interesting thing is the comment here. Uh, the charter goes into effect in 2025, includes a provision barring teams from participating in any automobile or truck racing series not sanctioned by NASCAR. Um, so Which I'm not sure what that means. Strange, because most of the teams have teams in other disciplines of motorsport. Do they? Other than I mean, like Penske? So Penske definitely does. I mean, they also yeah, own does, the car. Yeah, how does that work? Penske also has sports cars. Does does that mean? I mean, this article could be written by a person who's not a car person, so maybe it maybe it means another type of stock car racing, which I don't know of any other type of stock car racings because NASCAR has basically pushed everyone out. Yeah, there is no other form of stock car racing. I don't think that's not owned by NASCAR. But if it means any kind of motorsports whatsoever, there that's a few teams, like you said, you brought up Penske. Um. SHR or Stuart Haas, they're going to be gone. Oh, okay. But yeah. Haas still has cars and other series. Track house. They gave up their charter because they did, but that's they're still going to be a Haas charter. There, so okay. SA, SHR was Stuart Haas, was Tony Stewart and Haas or Haas, Haas Technologies. Haas Technologies. Yeah. And that charter, those three charters have been dissolved, but Haas is remaining with one car. Okay. So that the, so those but they still have racing auto series. You know the aforementioned track house. They have a Trans Am team. Uh, they have a motorcycle team too, which doesn't seem like it's affected if that's the way it's written. Um, yes, and I'm just sure that most of them probably have stuff that we don't know about <laughs> because we don't know all the charters in and out. Like I'm sure Joe Gibbs Racing has been involved with IndyCar stuff in the past, as well as Bansky. So it just, it, it seems odd. And I know that all the other teams have now signed this. So maybe they're just planning on ignoring that part of the contract and saying, well, I mean, what's happening? Yeah, here? like, you know, how does it work with like Kyle Larson wants to run Indy again? They just look the other way because he's the, one of the biggest stars. Well, he's not the charter, he's just a driver. I know. But, his team is partnering with McLaren. Right. Sure. Penske McLaren, right? No. Hendrick. Oh, sorry. Hendrick. Yeah. 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 Cause it's a, they're Chevy powered McLarens. Yeah. So my, my brain is too many teams and names and drivers and series in my head here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, it just seems, it seems odd for sure. I just don't know what the actual, outcome will be I don't think that NASCAR is going to throw anybody out right I don't think they'll no that would be so so dumb I think it would be suicide for them to throw Michael Jordan out of the out of the league like I don't think you would have sued NASCAR if you didn't have Michael Jordan part of the team I don't think they'd throw Denny Hamlin out honestly no, I don't think they would either. You know, he's been a driver for 20 years. He's brought a lot to the sport. He's a he's a household name to anybody who's a NASCAR family. Like, he's not... It just, it just seems odd. What seemed more odd to me is, and I'm sure there's more politics to this that we don't know because we're, you know, just looking at it from the outside. But I guarantee you that if Penske and Hendrick and all these legacy teams have signed a contract because they said they were just tired of waiting. I guarantee you that they know already that they, what they can get away with 
with that contract and what the fines are going to be, and they'll just pay them. You yeah, know, that's probably a big part of it. They're probably care. like, oh, sure, okay. This contract says I can't do this, but the fine is a million dollars if I do it. Whatever, I'll just sign the contract, pay a million dollars. I don't care. Hmm. You know, that could be a, a huge part of it. Or they could have been some backdoor dealing with those big teams. They're like, we don't like this, but make ours say this and we'll sign it. And, you know, NASCAR, the France family, unfortunately, like I said, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. There's no oversight on them. They're not like, you know, sanctioned by the FIA. So they can do whatever they want. (laughs) So, and it comes down to them making money. That's what they've been good at for the past 30 years. And that's what they're going to keep doing. They're, They're no longer a racing family. They're a money family, just like anything else. Now I'm going to start getting angry about it. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, auto off topic, anti capitalist (laughs) Well, conversation. Anyway, I guess that's enough NASCAR talk. So that's, that's the big drama is the, the, the charter lawsuit. I think it is. It, It should be interesting to see how it plays out. My guess is something will be settled before anything is an actual court battle. And we'll have an answer for this probably before next season starts. Yep, definitely. Because theoretically, those two teams don't have charters next season, so they can't race. Yeah. I highly doubt that's going to happen. I do too. And if it does, take all their money and put it to a different racing series and see what happens. You know, maybe this would be the brick that starts the NASCAR wall tumbling and they have to change their ways. Which could only be for the better. <laughs> you end up like a a split like the open world uh, open wheeled cars back in the day. Uh, that would be bad, <laughs> but yeah. But there'd have to be. I, I'm just thinking that there has to be. This has to be a good thing. I don't think if it was a bad thing that Jordan and Hamlin and Front Row would have gone this far, because they have to know that their results are pretty much guaranteed what they want. It... Jordan is a savvy businessman. It cannot be not calculated. Yeah. Did you watch that movie last year about the Nike deal with him? Yes. Air. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely wild. He gets he gets his business dealing brain from his mama, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And Hamlin's not too shabby himself, so. No, I mean, Hamlin is one of the, the most well-paid NASCAR drivers in the history of NASCAR because of his business dealings. The man owns a race team and a private jet, so he's definitely definitely doing well. He's not a Kaz Grala who has to sometimes pay to race. Yeah. He makes a lot of money. Anyway, moving on. Project Car Stuff, Andrew. What do you got? I have I have it on good authority because I belong to the Auto Out Topic Discord where things get discussed that you have made some progress on a Volvo. I got it on the lift. Um, Celebrate drain- all progress. Yep. Uh, I drained all the fluids because uh, I didn't have much time to do anything else. Um, that is that is what I'm going to do since I cannot go to the Japanese car day show. Uh, after soccer, I'm going to go work on the car and get the, try to get the transmission out of it. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I finally got up in the air. I was looking underneath it. Um, it's dirty but solid. So, good job. That's what I thought. I mean, I, I knew where the pukey areas were. You know, the bottoms of both rockers in front of the rear wheels are like not perfect, but they're fine. And there were a couple of spots in the floor that looked like they might have had some water leak in the cabin and like pool up in the floorboard. And the floor might have a couple of patches that need to be put in there, but nothing that's like structural or nothing that's a problem. All very minor stuff that you can fix. I don't even think the floor is that bad. It was, it, Felt a little soft, but I. I no, my my like guess that. is that when you pull the carpet out, there'll be some pinholes, and you can probably fill them with you know just a little weld plug, and then just sand it down and be fine. So, uh, I mean, on second look, I don't even think it was that bad. It it had like a weird. There's like a weird patch, in the front right corner, but it's kind of it's like gooped up and patched with. Whatever as well. I don't know. It's fine. But everything else. At the end of the day, it's not a show car. It's a driver, and it's perfect for that. 
yeah, all the suspension, none of that's rusted. It's, nope. and, no, and nothing that it mounts to is rusted. It's all covered in heavy undercoating that Volvo used. It's just yep. then caked on top with, you know, Alaska mud or whatever the heck it was. It's on there. Yeah. So the, the, the biggest thing I look at when looking at a car like that is the bottoms of the fenders and then the strut towers front and rear and the frame rails and all of that looked solid in that car. Anything it, else is repairable. It was so dirty. Uh, I still need, I'll try to get it up like on like ramps and like pressure wash it. Um, that you couldn't initially tell that it had Bilstein's. Yeah. They were just mud. Yeah. And so now that I was able to go under there and clean them off, they're hundred percent Bilstein's and those are lowering springs. I can't remember what the name is or how to pronounce it. Something with an L. Um, but that all looks good. Uh, it looks pretty solid. I don't think play a do game much... of lowering spring or flat pack, flat pack furniture name. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It sounds like a, a name of a Ikea, uh, piece of furniture. So, um, but it all looks good. Like I'm not going to have to do anything. I think to the suspension, uh, I'll flush the brakes and check, you know, make sure the pads are good, but, and probably maybe I'll replace the rotors cause they're, They've been sitting there kind of rusty, but, um, it needs a rear wheel seal. I can see that's leaking. So I'd probably do both sides cause I think you can pull up the axles out and, uh, it's got a little itty bitty drive shaft. It's so small. Um, like it's like, uh, like two inches or something. Cause I was looking at parts for it. Damn it's carry bearing. I, yeah, okay. it's tiny. So is it, is it skinny or, or short or both? Uh, it's two piece, so it's got a carry bearing in the middle. Okay. Which is interesting for a real drive car. Um, so I just happened to like, I was like, look at it. I was like, oh, I better check this out. And I pushed on it and it totally flopped around. So that's like super cheap, like 50 bucks or something for the carry bearing. So once again, a Volvo is a great first classic car because parts availability is ridiculous. It's going to come out anyways. I'll take that out. Um, I was able to drain the radiator from the the drain plug. Uh, that's not great. That radiator is going to come out and be repaired because um, they painted the car with the radiator in it. So it's red and just in general crummy looking. Yeah, not there's, a lot, there's a lot of cleanup on that car. will will go a long way. Um, but yeah, once I get the um transmission out you know pull the clutch pull the flywheel see how it looks if they look okay i might reuse them if not i'll buy new ones they're not very expensive and um you know i think from there i'll pull the engine out or i'll pull the head off and then pull the engine out because it'll just be easier in pieces yeah much easier but so try to make some make a progress on that this weekend Excellent. I'm excited to see said progress. So it looks, uh, the video you put in the discord was encouraging. So it's the video I've been waiting for just the walk around on the bottom of the car, kind of checking everything out and making sure it is all good. So it'll be, it'll be fun. One of the most rewarding things on an old car like that is that first disassembly and cleaning of things and seeing how in decent shape everything really is. So I'm excited to see that. I did do a quick uh, buffing of some of one half of the hood on the Dodge Ram 50 slash Mighty Max, only because I was outside and I had some time to kill and didn't have enough time to like get involved in anything else. And I was like, oh, I'll just try this right here. And uh, the report is that uh, where there is paint left, at least it shines up decently. And all of the chalkiness came right off. So it will have a, a nice kind of shiny patina look to it when it's all done. But no update on that. I haven't had a chance to get in there and play with the wiring and play with other things to make it run. But soon, soon after this weekend, maybe I'll try to work on that Sunday too. So one step at a time. But about, that's really it. 
I have nothing about, else. How about scale project cars? I did a couple of things. I talked about right. doing. I wanted to finish that wild one kit um, last week, so I finished doing the decals on it, and I tried the wet decal method. So I have a little tiny, you know, maybe it's like an eight ounce or six ounce pump spray bottle, like a, you know, like the, the it's like a thumb pump sprayer, right? Sure. Yep. So put some mild soapy water in there. And um, the decals for the wild one aren't too big. So, you know, of course, for an RC car, they're not pre-cut. So you get that really, you need a really sharp exacto, right? And you try to cut as close as you can to the printed area and not have too much clear uh, material left. I'd peel it off, spray the Lexan body, spray the back of the decal. And even when you do that, it still kind of wants to stick. So it's not like super slippery. So you kind of get it. I got them positioned where I want, especially the big ones. Pushed them down a little bit. And then I just used a microfiber and squeegees them out. And they came out really nice. So uh, now that I've got that technique figured out, my next little project when I want to kill some time is do all the uh, Toyota decals on that Celica rally car body that came on the TTO2 you gave me. Excellent. Because that's got some bigger decals. Do you have time to like peel the decal back up? With the Soviet yeah, I it? did actually. Because uh, it wasn't like, as long as you didn't push it too hard. Like if you put it and you didn't like the position, as long as you didn't really put any pressure, you could peel it back up. And as I would peel it back up, I'd also spray more soapy water on it sure just to keep it yeah damp and you could reposition it a little bit it's definitely the easier way to do it excellent because i have in my scale project our update stuff i did finish actually start and finish <laughs> took me two nights yeah, pretty simple pretty, kit. pretty simple kit the grasshopper 2 that you had uh, gifted me as a garage warming gift even the garage isn't done yet but I still have to do the paint and bodywork stuff on that. And I'm undecided whether I'm just going to slap the decals over the white plastic or paint it a different color first. So we'll see. I was considering just doing it like a box art style and then buying a second body and doing something different, but we'll find I think out. you should do that. Just do a box art style? I think you should do both. Maybe you have a box art one, maybe you have a custom one. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking of doing. So, because it's not a polycarbonate clear plastic body shell on that. It's a hard plastic body shell. So, using traditional model kit painting methods will work. So, yeah. I was mapping out some interesting color schemes with a metallic brown base and red and yellow details. So, I was thinking more like a, I would I would do more like a neon type stuff, but it's your, your deal. Maybe. I don't know. I get, I, I'll be looking. I'll, I'll show you some ideas later, but we'll see. I want to finish one body first, anyway. Um, I haven't run it yet. Uh, all the electronics are in it. My battery charger doesn't have the Tamiya style connector. connectors, so I was looking online and I ordered from just from Amazon a Dean's plug to Tamiya, um, like jumper lead. Yeah, because my charger came with Dean's connectors on it. So I don't want to switch all of I, I most of my RC cars I used to run with the the power poles. Mm -hmm. But this being in classic Tamiya kit, I think I want to leave it with the Tamiya plugs. So I need to have that adapter. So I ordered that adapter so I can charge the battery and then uh, run the car. But that also will make it so that I don't run the car before decaling it. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to do that and then, you know, scratch the body and then I can't lay the decals down. <laughs> Yeah, I ran the um, I ran the wild one. That it was pretty fun. It's it's decently quick with the torque tune motor, but it's funny. It is kind of light in the front. It's like hard to hard to get it to steer in the dirt, but whatever. It's fun. It was fun to drive around. Well, I know this one here will not be very quick because it has a three eighty style, not a five forty motor. But yeah, I'm gonna run it with that just for the first couple of battery packs, and then I'll probably also get that same torque tune motor for it. So again, like we were talking about earlier on online, when we were chatting, like 
we're not really into this to make the fastest, best handling race thing. Like we're just into it for the nostalgia of it. And then like the, the trucks and stuff, we like the scale appearance. Like it's like building a model car that functions. It's cool. <laughs> it's a neat thing. Well, yeah, I like the way the wild one came out. There's actually pictures I put on last week and a lot of people looked at them of the, they're on out of topic Instagram. I like the way it came out. It looks really cool. It had a little driver figure that I detail painted with to my acrylics after I painted the Lexan part that uh, is part of his body that's on there. And uh, it looks really cool. And it just looks the part. And yeah, I got no, it those, looks really cool. The color combo is neat. I got those, uh, some custom blockhead motors decals and added some of those for a little extra flair. And yeah, it came out awesome. It's got that period look to it. Did I lose you? Nope, I'm right here. Sorry. Okay. I have uh, another meeting. I'm supposed to be at at seven, but I was just telling them, just texting them, I'm going to be late. So, no big deal. Oh. Well, no we biggie. can wrap it up, anyways. No biggie. Life goes but, on. Um, yeah, I. Uh, uh, our weekly meeting for the uh, Arizona Rising Sun Rally. So, oh, I have one more thing to talk about before we go too far. Going back to Project Car stuff. Yep. I'm incredibly mad at the 78 gold. Okay. Um, this past weekend was Kyusha Club. Yes. Which is a spectacular event in downtown Phoenix. Can't say enough about the event. The cars that show up, the people, the whole vibe of the thing, amazing. I didn't even realize, I don't think, that there was a true Akasuka GTR in Phoenix, like a true S20 twin cam car. And it was there. <laughs> so cool. Um, my intention was to bring the Colt down, but if you remember two weeks ago, I talked about driving the Colt and it overheated. So it's always been a problem that the Colt overheats once every year or two. You flush it out, you take care of it. Everything's fine. Another year or two. Can't figure out why, but it's always been every year or two, so I just kind of forget about it. Well, it had been a week, and I flush it out. I changed the oil. I flush it again. I ran it in my driveway for almost an hour, put a, a load on it in the yard, ran it for almost an hour. No issue at all. Got to, like, normal operating temperature. Everything was totally fine. Perfect. Shut it down, cleaned it up, got it ready to go to Kyosha Club show Saturday morning. Left here at like 6, 10 a.m. Made it four miles. So not nearly as far as last time. And the car overheated again. Weird. Yep. So instead of being at Kyosha Club by 6.30 like I wanted to be, because we had a special spot where we could park to promote our... Arizona Rising Sun Rally, which was super awesome. And I'd like to thank them for allowing us to do that because we got a ton of interest from that event. Um, I spent an hour sitting at the sketchiest QT in the valley, <laughs> waiting for the car to cool down enough to try to limp it home again, which I did. And then I was all frustrated. I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to go. Once I also calmed down, I just jumped in the 944 and left. By the time I got there, I had to park three blocks away in a parking lot that was also full of cars that were there for the event. So wow. I should show you the size of the event. Yeah, there Phoenix were, blocks. So the real blocks. Yeah, and there were two blocks of uh, parking lots that were full of other cars that were there for the event. So the event space isn't huge. It's definitely first come, first serve. Um, I did still have a parking spot saved for me, but it was saved for the purpose of promoting the Arizona Rising Sun Rally, which is an all Japanese car event, and I had the 944, so I did not take said spot. But nonetheless, uh, super cool event. If you're in the area, definitely check it out. I mean, it's it's basically a a takeover of downtown Phoenix, not in the traditional or the new way of using the word takeover, I guess, but it's just. Any open spot, street spot, parking spot, there's something cool there. You know, the actual event space itself is reserved for, I don't know the official year cutoff, but I'd say it's probably pre-2000. 
so pre-2000 Euro or Japanese cars. Uh, and then all the area immediately around it is full of those same era cars. And then there's some other more modern stuff that filters in to some of the other spots in the area because there's not really... You can't police every parking lot downtown. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. But it's, it's the majority of it is uh, pre-2000s enthusiast European or Japanese cars. So it's right up our alley. And man, what an event. It's so good. My One of my favorite events here in Phoenix. So... Yeah, it sounds cool. I'm jealous. The pictures look cool. Yeah, I, I've only posted a few. I have more to post. Um, I should actually put some up. Kept meaning to and then got busy with work during the work day and then been trying not to use my social media at night. Try to mm-hmm. keep my own time for myself. <laughs> yeah. Social media on work hours only. What? Nope. Well, I, I, is that what I meant? At lunch. Lunch only. So anyway. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the other little part that I wanted to get in there. So Cool. Excellent. Well, I think that's an episode, my friend. Excellent. I like yeah. it. So you'll be in Williams uh, when this podcast is released or on your way to the Pitbull concert. Um. Podcast gets released on Friday morning, so I'll be on my way to work. Well, and I'll be at the Audrain. And I know we have a bunch of people local here that are going to Japanese Car Day, and I'm bummed I will miss them. But uh, in lieu of that, I promise to work on the Volvo. Excellent. Well, I will be at Williams, and I don't promise to do anything because after the whole scenario I told you about Friday night into Saturday, I will probably be tired on Sunday, so I can't promise that I will be working on the truck. Also, it's been unseasonably warm here. It's early October. It's supposed to be like 80s and 90s now, and it's still been over 110. So, yeah. Another reason I haven't worked on things outside. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to finish that air-conditioned garage soon. All right. So... You can find us on Off Topic Podcast on Facebook, Out Off Topic on Instagram and Threads. I'm racing around Threads. We also have Scale Autocast on uh, Instagram and Threads that we've been sharing a bunch of RC stuff too. I've actually gotten a lot of notes from people like, oh, I, I remember having those kits and really making me feel nostalgic for that stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. So, um, Brad, where can they find you? They can find me on the Discord. They can find me also posting on Scale Autocast, but most of my stuff, uh, if you follow Auto, nope, that's the, that's the main one there. What's my thing? Uh, TSI SS three five zero is my Instagram and Threads handle. So find me there. All right, cool. As always, keep cars analog. Your burgers medium well, and aim for the roses. Unless you're in Arizona, then well only. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>